I'm Roberta DiBiase. I'm the liaison to the PAS uh, meeting from the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society, and I'm the ch Chief of Infectious Disease at Children's National in D.C., which is right down the street. And on behalf of the PIDS Programming Committee and my co-chairs, David Kaufman and Pablo Sanchez, who are in the first row, I welcome you to this two-hour special con uh, session focusing on Zika infection. We thank the PAS leadership for providing the opportunity and flexibility for this combined symposium, which is a special symposium and the Neonatal Sepsis Club in one session. As we're all well aware, there have been intense and appropriate media coverage of the current large-scale Zika epidemic that's emerged in the Americas, with particularly severe impact on pregnant women and their fetuses. Because of the association between Zika infection and microcephaly, as well as other neurologic disorders, the World Health Organization has declared the current Zika epidemic a public health emergency of international concern. As pediatricians and scientists, we're called upon to use our collective skills and talents to solve this problem and to address the needs of affected individuals, particularly children. This problem will require the coordinated effort of epidemiologists, bench and clinical researchers, clinicians, and clinicians uh, including but not limited in any way to infectious disease physicians, neurologists, neonatologists, geneticists, pathologists, developmental pediatricians, so what better venue than the Pediatric Academic Societies to bring us all together to address this urgent need? Today, we will benefit from the collective knowledge and experience of our invited speakers who have been selected to represent the U.S. public health response, the frontline experience from an international perspective in an endemic setting, and their intersection at the research interface. And to start, to bring a laser-sharp focus onto the plight of affected patients to the very forefront of our discussion today, I'm going to lead off our session with a pertinent and instructive fetal case that we recently managed at Children's National Fetal Medicine Institute. I have nothing to disclose related to this presentation. So this is a 33-year-old prima gravid Washington, D.C. resident who vacationed for a week in Belize, Guatemala, and Cancun at 11 weeks gestation. Two days after returning to the U.S., she developed an illness that was mild and lasted five days. It consisted of low-grade fever, an erythematous maculopapular rash shown here on the right, myalgia, some mild photophobia, and no joint symptoms. Her husband, who also accompanied her on the trip, developed identical symptoms within the same time frame. She had an obstetrical evaluation at 13 weeks, which was one week after her symptoms, which was normal, and at 16 and 17 weeks gestation, which were four and five weeks post uh, symptoms, she had a repeat ultrasounds, which were normal. She had serum Zika IgM and IgG serology testing that was positive, as well as PCR positivity even four to five weeks after symptoms, establishing infection in this woman. She then had subsequently a 19-week ultrasound seven weeks after her symptoms, which showed abnormalities on fetal ultrasound, and is that point where she was referred to our center for multidisciplinary evaluation. And at our center, we perform fetal MRI, which I'll show you momentarily, and this showed uh, significant abnormalities in multiple areas of the brain. Amniotic fluid PCR was performed at that point and was positive. So the, the figures I'm going to show you are all in the paper we recently published in New England Journal on March 30th, and this included collaboration from our center, as well as Hopkins, and collaborators at the University of Helsinki in Finland, as well as the CDC labs in Fort Collins. The fetal ultrasound at 19 weeks showed no evidence of calcifications or microcephaly, but when we plotted out the fetal head circumference between the 16th and 20th week when this woman was evaluated, it was clear there was a drop-off from the 47th to the 24th percentile between 16 and 20 weeks of age, or gestation. The ultrasound on the top shows a thin cerebral cortex with increased extraaxial spaces a dilated third ventricle, and enlargement of the frontal horns with debris within them. There was an absent cavum septum pellucidum, which is concerning for abnormal forebrain development and particularly absence of the corpus callosum. And here below is a normal fetal ultrasound in an age-matched uh, gestational age uh, fetus that shows a clearly seen septum cavum pellucidum. 
These are the first MRI images done in a uh, Zika-infected uh, fetus, uh, and these are in the paper as well, some additional images. But I'd like to highlight here that there was severe atrophy of the cortical mantle seen uh, with only a 1.4 millimeter thickness compared to a normal uh, control at the same gestational age of eight millimeters. This child had severe atrophy in both the frontal and parietal areas, and this is the frontal that I'm showing you. In addition, our, our neuroradiology experts uh, pointed out that the normal lamination pattern was absent and the subplate zone was largely undetectable. On this uh, additional view, it's clear that the corpus callosum was small for gestational age with only 14 millimeters in antero-posterior uh, uh, dimension compared to a normal uh, gestational age match control which measured 20 millimeters. Interestingly, there were no focal destructive lesions in the cortex or white matter and the cerebellum appeared normal in size and appearance. Because of the severity of CNS abnormalities in this infant and the grave prognosis, the mother elected to terminate the pregnancy at 21 weeks. And this provided the opportunity at the request of the family to perform neuropathologic analysis of the fetus. These sections here show uh, the significantly affected parietal neocortex, and I highlight here that there was abundant apoptosis in this region morphologically, which was confirmed later with caspase 3 staining. In contrast, in an occipital cortex, which was unaffected, the uh, architecture of the neurons appeared normal. And the, nor the uh, neurons that are in this uh, area are considered intermediately differentiated post-migratory neurons. In contrast, when we looked at mature, well-differentiated neurons in the basal ganglia or uh, compared that to primitive cells in the germinal matrix of the ganglionic eminence, there was no damage. In addition to the cortical changes, there were extensive white matter abnormalities, including axonal rarefaction in the parietal areas and macrophage infiltrates in both the cortical, shown above this uh, line, the brown staining cells, CD68 positive cells, as well as in the subcortical white matter. And on electron microscopy, we could demonstrate virus in the brain tissue. Our collaborators in Finland were able to cultivate uh, virus from the, the fetal tissues, particularly brain, and the brain was inoculated onto both neuroblastoma and vero cells, where uh, you can see by immunohistochemistry, immunofluorescence assay, uh, that there was abundant virus. And the viral loads were highest in the fetal brain as compared to the fetal membrane and cord and placenta. So this case really highlights and brings to our mind um, the severity of the uh, effects that occur that can occur on the pregnant woman infected with Zika virus. Thousands of women are facing identical challenges to this family's, both in those uh, in the case of those residing in endemic areas and those that are visiting uh, areas that, who reside in the United States. So we're now going to move to our three invited speakers, uh, and what we're going to do is allow approximately 30 minutes per speaker and hold our questions till the end so that we can have a robust discussion amongst all the panelists and the speakers for about 20 minutes at the end. So it's really my honor to introduce our first speaker. We have Sonia Rasmussen from the Centers for Disease Control. Dr. Rasmussen is a pediatrician and clinical geneticist who served on the CDC's Zika's response as the senior consultant. She also acted as co-lead of the Pregnancy and Birth Defects Task Force. She's also editor-in-chief in her spare time uh, of the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, and she um, is taking time out of her incredibly busy schedule to talk to us today, so thank you very much. Great, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you about Zika virus in the Americas. And um, I was asked to give you a broad overview, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start with what is Zika virus? It's a flavivirus, closely related to other flavoviruses, dengue, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, and West Nile viruses. It's a single-stranded RNA virus, and it looks really similar to other flavoviruses structurally, except for in the envelope proteins, which might serve as an attachment site of the virus to host cells and might explain some of the findings that we've been seeing. It's transmitted to humans primarily through uh, bite of the mosquito, uh, and the mosquitoes that most often transmit uh, Zika virus are the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, mainly Aedes aegypti, although um, recently it does appear that Aedes albopictus can transmit Zika virus as well. 
So um, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, uh, a few years ago we were looking at West Nile virus, and it's very different from the West Nile virus mosquito, the Culex mosquitoes. These are really daytime biters, where the Culex mosquitoes are um, night, dawn and dusk biters, and they prefer to bite people versus birds or other animals. They live indoors and outdoors and also bite at night. And they also transmit dengue and chikungunya viruses. They lay eggs in domestic water containing, water holding containers, so it's really important to get rid of those water holding containers around, in and around households where they like to be. And um, even though mosquito-borne transmission appears to be the most common form of transmission, there are other modes of transmission. First, maternal fetal, mother to baby, either during pregnancy or also there have been some cases at the time of uh, uh, delivery. And um, there's sexual transmission. We're learning more and more about sexual transmission. We had a hint about sexual transmission before this outbreak, but it's fairly clear now that sexual transmission is a significant mode of transmission. And there has been a report of a laboratory exposure. There's also uh, theoretical modes of transmission, blood transfusions, organ or tissue transplantations, and breast milk. Um, so Zika virus was first identified in a monkey in Uganda in 1947, and between 1947 and 2007, there were really only sporadic human disease cases reported from Africa and Southeast Asia. In 2007, there was the first widespread outbreak of Zika virus on Yap Island, um, which is in the Federated States of Micronesia, and my colleagues at CDC from the Vector Borne Disease uh, Group did evaluate uh, that big outbreak at that time. And much of the information that we had about Zika at the beginning of this outbreak was based on the data from YAP. In 2013, 2014, there were an estimated about 32,000 cases reported from French Polynesia. And then in May of 2015, the World Health Organization uh, confirmed that there were local there was local transmission in the Americas in Brazil of Zika virus although there uh, it appears that there was Zika virus probably before that time but that was when the World Health Organization uh, confirmed it so these are the areas uh, with Zika virus, the countries and territories in the Americas. Right now there are 35 uh, countries and territories uh, affected. And you can see um, in the purple here those countries and territories. There are three U.S. territories, American Samoa, um, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and then there's a quite a significant outbreak right now in Puerto Rico. Um, there are 43 countries and territories worldwide that are affected. And it's important, um, this, these numbers are changing every day, so if you're wanting to talk to families or wanting to know about uh, transmission, it's important to look at the latest data on the CDC website. Um, what about Zika virus in the United States? Well, I've told you that there are three territories that have outbreaks or have local transmission. Um, in the 50 states, in the contiguous U.S. and Alaska and Hawaii, there hasn't been any local vector-borne, mosquito-borne transmission, although there has been uh, proven sexual transmission in the United States. However, we know with all those countries out there that have Zika virus transmission that we'll have people coming back, people who have traveled there that will be coming back, and if they get bit, bitten, bitten by a mosquito, they can transmit it to somebody else. And so we do, uh, we are preparing for the possibility of local transmission, mosquito-borne transmission in the United States uh, during, is during the summer. And here you can see um, the uh, 80s aegypti and the 80s albopictus um, areas of distribution. This is CDC's best information about where those um, mosquitoes are found in the U.S. and um, so they can give us an idea of where to be watching for cases of local transmission. Here are the laboratory confirmed Zika virus cases, disease cases that have been reported to CDC. And here you can see that most cases have seen at least some cases, some, most states have seen at least some cases of Zika virus. Um, some, a lot more cases than others, but most cases have, most states have seen some. You can see widespread outbreaks, as I said, in Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and then in American Samoa. So what are the clinical features? And you're going to see some additional pictures later. These are pictures from the, one of the New England Journal papers. The most common symptoms are rash, fever, joint pain, and conjunctivitis. Um, other symptoms include muscle pain and headache. And for most people, um, Zika virus is not that big of a deal. 
unless you're pregnant. Um, for most people, clinical illness is mild. Symptoms last several days to a week. Um, severe disease requiring hospitalization is uncommon, and fatalities are rare, although you may have heard there was a fatality in the last couple of days in Puerto Rico. Um, there also has been, as has been seen with a lot of other infections, there is, uh, does appear to be a link with Guillain-Barre syndrome following suspected Zika virus infection. So the reason why we all care about Zika virus is because Zika virus causes problems in pregnant women. And we know that pregnant women can be infected through a mosquito bite or through sex with an infected male partner. If infected around the time of conception, we recognize that Zika virus could present a risk to the fetus, and therefore we have provided recommendations um, for uh, waiting until, to get pregnant uh, for a time period after you return. If infected during pregnancy, we know that Zika can be passed to the fetus during pregnancy or at the time of birth. And um, as you heard, there was a, a substantial, and you're going to hear more from Dr. Safadi about uh, the substantial increase in the number of cases with microcephaly that was seen a few months after the uh, cases of Zika were first seen. And I just want to point out that this isn't just a small head. These are kids that have a really severely small head. You can see very small in this area. And a number of the kids have had um, something called cutis vertices gerata or the scalp rugae. And this is something that is consistent with a condition that has been called fetal brain disruption sequence. I'll show you some more on the next slide about that. We think at least some of these kids have this very particular sequence that is, uh, we believe, caused by damage to brain cells and then a collapse of the fetal solid skull, and that's why you see the uh, scalp rugae. Um, in the paper that uh, Schuler Faccini published in our MMWR early on in the response, about a third of the kids that she reported had the scalp rugae. You can also see the overlapping of the sutures, the prominent occiput, here you can see some overlapping here where it looks like the um, occipital bone is over these frontal bones here. And that's typical with field brain disruption sequence. So it was first described in 1984. As I said, there's brain disruption, destruction that results in collapse of the fetal skull, severe microcephaly, scalp rugae, and neurologic impairment. And these are cases uh, from a series that was reported in 1990, um, and it appears similar to the affected babies, at least a uh, number of the babies that we at CDC have seen in Brazil and that were reported by other investigators from Brazil. Um, this is a pretty rare sequence, at least it was was before Zika virus. Um, it's something that uh, there was a review by Corona Rivera in 2001, and at that time there were about 20 babies um, that had been reported in the literature with fetal brain disruption sequence. What other brain abnormalities? A wide range of severe brain abnormalities have been reported, and I'm just going to go through these quickly. Intracranial calcifications, there's hydrocephalus. You can see here's the intracranial calcifications. You can see they're distributed throughout the brain. Um, you can see the uh, severe hydrocephaly. Um, there's other uh, migration disorders as well. So uh, lots of different severe brain abnormalities seen with these kids. Um, there are a number of other problems that have been seen in children uh, affected with Zika virus um, that are believed to be related to the central nervous system injury that has occurred, and those include eye abnormalities, and I think uh, some of the other speakers have pictures of those eye abnormalities, um, hearing impairment, seizures, swallowing problems, hypertonicity and posturing, contractures, including club foot and arthrogryposis. About 10% of the kids had uh, club foot or arthrogryposis in that original schuler Ficini paper, irritability, developmental delay, and then some of the kids have had growth abnormalities, so, although it's not clear, at least to me, how frequent that is. So I wanted to go through briefly some of the evidence that led us at CDC to confirm that, that we believe that Zika virus is a cause of microcephaly and serious brain anomalies. And this was one of the studies. This is a study that was done in Sharif Zaki's lab at CDC um, that uh, looked at and found Zika virus RNA in the brains of two infants who had died shortly after birth um, with microcephaly. Uh, Zika virus RNA has also been seen in amniotic fluid. It was seen in the placenta, and it was seen in products of conception after two pregnancy losses, early pregnancy losses. 
Um, you're going to hear more later about this study from Brazil, um, 42 women with laboratory confirmed Zika virus. Dr. Nielsen's going to talk a lot more about this. And uh, about 29% of those 42 had abnormalities detected, including two intrauterine fetal deaths. Then uh, in the outbreak in French Polynesia that wasn't recognized at the time of the outbreak, but retrospectively investigators there have recognized that there was an increase in the number of babies in microcephaly following that outbreak as well. Using some modeling, using surveillance data and serologic data, they have estimated that women who were uh, infected during the first trimester of pregnancy had about a 1% risk of having a baby with microcephaly. And then uh, you just heard from Dr. DiBiase about uh, the case from Washington, D.C., so I'm not going to go th uh, through that in any um, depth, but this was really a key case for helping us to understand um, the relationship between Zika virus and microcephaly. So um, this is the paper that we published on April 13th in the New England Journal where we reviewed the evidence for causality and we used two sets of criteria. One was the Shepherd's criteria, which is a, a, are, have been used in the past for looking at teratogens, things that cause problems during pregnancy, and the other were the Bradford Hill criteria. And we felt that both of these criteria were met to be able to say that Zika virus is a cause of microcephaly and other brain anomalies. However, there's lots and lots of questions that remain. Um, what is the full range of potential health problems that Zika virus infection may cause? I think um, it, if we're looking at how other teratogens have been recognized and how that started and then what we know about the teratogens now, usually what we see at the start is the tip of the iceberg. And I think um, many of us expect that that's the case, that we'll see a much wider spectrum, including pregnancy loss, stillbirths, miscarriages, um, perhaps later developmental delay, maybe hearing loss in kids that don't have microcephaly. Um, but we don't have the answers to all of that right now. What is the level of risk from a Zika virus infection during pregnancy? That number from um, the, the uh, paper from French Polynesia was from a modeling study, so we really need some more data on that. When during pregnancy does Zika virus pose the highest risk to the fetus? And then are there times during pregnancy that it isn't a problem at all? We don't know that right now. We know that the babies that have had microcephaly have had exposures. Their moms had exposures in the first trimester or early second trimester. And then what are other factors are involved? Could there be co-occurring infections? Could a pre, if you've had previous dengue infection, could you have more of a risk, a higher risk or a lower risk? Um, nutritional factors. Are mothers who have symptoms at higher risk or lower risk um, that it might affect the risk for birth effects? So a lot of those questions remain. Um, CDC is doing a lot of studies right now to uh, working with our partners to learn more. And one of them that I wanted to make you all aware of is the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry. There's also a Zika Active Pregnancy Surveillance System in Puerto Rico that's been set up and uh, is starting to collect data. Um, we're collaborating with investigators in Colombia to monitor pregnancy outcomes in women with Zika virus disease. And already there have been four babies there that have had uh, Zika virus disease, um, babies that have microcephaly. We're also collaborating with investigators in Brazil to uh, perform a case control study to study the link with microcephaly. And we're studying how long the virus stays in semen, urine, and breast milk, because that's really important for um, uh, prevention uh, guidelines. So just briefly, what is the U.S. Zika Pregnancy Registry? It's to monitor pregnancy and infant outcomes following Zika virus infection during pregnancy and to inform clinical guidance and public health response. And we're already using data that we've uh, collected through this pregnancy registry to help uh, uh, update our guidelines. And our guidelines will continue to be updated, so it's always important. I'm going to tell you today about what our current guidelines are for infants, for workup of infants. But I will tell you that it will change. As we get more information, we will be updating those guidelines. So it's important to look for the latest data that's on the internet. 
Um, the registry is a supplemental surveillance system, and it really is put together through the collaboration with state, tribal, local, and territorial health departments. They collect the information that they get from uh, practitioners and then um, uh, work with us to uh, put it together. Who's included? It's pregnant women with laboratory evidence of Zika virus infection, if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, and exposed infants born to these women. And then if the infant, sometimes the mother wasn't wasn't identified, but the infant is identified, um, we would include those cases too. So I was asked to talk about the guidelines for um, healthcare providers caring for infants and children with possible Zika virus infection, and this is a paper we published in the MMWR in mid-February. Um, and uh, so we talked about who is who should be tested, what infants should be tested. They, uh, we recommend that infants be tested if they're mothers um, had either positive or inconclusive studies, or if the baby has any findings that are consistent, like uh, microcephaly or intracranial calcifications or other sorts of findings that could be consistent with Zika virus disease. So for those infants whose moms are positive or babies had something that tells you that maybe the baby has Zika virus disease, we are recommending a thorough physical exam, including measurements, a cranial ultrasound, and then further evaluation, including for neurologic abnormalities, dysmorphic features, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly. And some of this is really because from what we know from other infections. It's not that we've seen these things in Zika virus, but we want to evaluate for these because they've been seen with other infections. Um, we uh, want everybody to be sure to not miss their, uh, these babies do not miss their newborn hearing screen, and they should have an eye exam. Um, the recommended tests are the Zika virus RNA using RT-PCR and IgM and neutralizing antibodies, and we also recommend testing for dengue at the same time. Clinical specimens, uh, serum, either obtained from the umbilical cord or directly within two days of birth if possible. And if uh, cerebrospinal fluid is obtained for other studies, we would want that to be tested for Zika as well. Um, we also recommend that uh, investigators uh, consider histopathologic evaluation, and that can be done at CDC um, for immunohistochemical histo staining for fixed tissue or for RT-PCR. And if not already tested, sometimes the mom hasn't been tested. If the mom hasn't been tested, we would uh, recommend that the mom be tested for, uh, for Zika and for dengue. Um, so again, Zika virus testing for infants is recommended for infants with any abnormality that could be uh, associated with Zika if there's no known etiology. And infants, all infants whose moms have been positive or had inconclusive test results. It's not recommended for infants just because a mom traveled to a place. If, if the infant is born without abnormalities associated with Zika virus and the mom has had negative or no Zika virus testing, we're not recommending testing for those babies. Um, what is the additional evaluation for infants with microcephaly or intracranial calcifications or other brain or eye abnormalities? For infants with microcephaly, we recommend uh, that they be examined by a clinical geneticist or dysmorphologist, um, be seen by a pediatric neurologist, and then a pediatric infectious disease specialist. Um, we recommend further testing, some laboratory testing, uh, uh, CBC, platelets, et cetera. Um, the recommended long-term follow-up, we really don't know what will happen with these kids long-term. Uh, it is important that they re be reported to the state, territorial, or local health department and uh, monitored, and we expect that as we learn more, we'll be able to uh, provide more information, more guidance of how these kids should be followed. We're recommending that you should consider screening kids at six months of life because we do know with other viruses, sometimes the hearing appears to be normal at birth and then and the hearing becomes abnormal later on. Um, we also recommend carefully evaluating head circumference and development and milestones through the first year of life. As I said before, certainly this could, um, the microcephaly and brain defects that we're seeing could be the tip of the iceberg and there could be other um, problems that are seen later on. 
So reporting Zika virus disease cases, Zika virus is a nationally notifiable disease, and healthcare reporters are encouraged to report cases to uh, their health departments, and health departments are requested to notify CDC of those cases, and so that we can con continue to have an up-to-date information on the geographic spread of Zika virus. Um, Timely reporting allows health departments to assess and reduce the risk of local transmission or to mitigate further spread. Initial assessment and treatment, there's no specific antiviral therapy for Zika virus. Treatment is supportive, rests, fluids, analgesics, antipyretics. Um, suspected Zika virus, people with suspected Zika virus infection should, uh, the consideration for possible dengue or chikungunya should be considered. And um, Aspirin and non uh, anti-inflammatory drugs should be avoided until dengue can be ruled out. And of course, in kids, you're not going to want to use aspirin because of the risk of Rye syndrome. Um, Zika virus preventive measures. Um, as you know, there's no vaccine or prevention uh, medication to prevent. There's no pre prophylactic medication to prevent infection or disease. So it really is primary prevention um, to reduce mosquito exposure. Long sleeves, long pants, um, mosquito repellents, permethrin-treated clothing. It's important that as much as possible people can stay in air-conditioned places or places with window and door screens or sleeping under a mosquito bed net if air-conditioned or screen rooms are not available. Um, it's important that the community get involved in eliminating standing water in and around homes. And uh, CDC in mid-January, as soon as the Zika virus was, was identified in the brain of uh, those first two cases, CDC has been recommending that pregnant women not travel to areas with ongoing Zika virus transmission, and we continue to, um, to uh, try to make sure that people are aware of that recommendation. For men who live in or who have traveled to an area with Zika, we know that it's possible for that man to come back and um, uh, that if Zika virus, if he was infected with Zika virus, he could spread it to his partner. Um, so if the man's partner is pregnant, they should use condoms or not have sex during the pregnancy. And it's important that people who are infected with Zika virus take steps to prevent getting bitten once they come back to the U.S. because during the first week of illness, they're at risk for a mosquito biting them and then biting somebody else and transmitting it. What is the progress about the on Zika vaccine, and Dr. Safadi is going to talk a little bit more about this. Um, I'll just say that our colleagues at NIH have been working on virus uh, on vaccines for other flavor viruses that have given them a head start uh, to be working on a Zika vaccine. And uh, vector control, of course, is really important. But there are challenges to that vector control. Uh, there are, have been some pretty significant issues with resistance to some of the insecticides. So you can be doing targeted outdoor residual spraying, targeted indoor residual spraying, um, widespread space spraying. But there are problems because, uh, in some cases, these mosquitoes are resistant to those insecticides. It's important to destroy sites where mosquitoes lay eggs, and um, I'm told that even a very small amount, even a small amount of water that could be in um, a soda, a plastic soda bottle, uh, the cap um, can be enough for mosquito to lay eggs and lots and lots of mosquitoes. So it's important to eliminate standing water. Um, also, uh, larvicide in containers, tires, and tree holes has been uh, effective. There are some novel approaches, and the effects of these novel approaches remain uncertain, but there's a lot of discussion about them, so I was asked to mention them. Um, the genetic control of the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, and that is rearing mosquitoes that are genetically modified to express the repressible lethal gene, and so that those male mosquitoes then are allowed to go out into the wild and, and, and impregnate the uh, female mosquitoes, I don't know exactly how that works, but anyway, um, and then uh, the, um, the new set of mosquitoes die, and that has been shown to significantly um, reduce the number of mosquitoes in an area. Another uh, novel approach that has been discussed a lot is um, using uh, Wolbachia bacteria that can prevent arboviruses from replicating in mosquitoes. So both of those are things that are being um, uh, followed up on um, and uh, do provide some thoughts of ways that, uh, other ways of vector control other than insecticides. 
So what is CDC doing in its response to the Zika virus? We're uh, monitoring spread of Zika virus through public health surveillance, working with our state and local partners. We really are dependent on them. As they give us information, then um, we can provide information to all of you. Um, we're increasing laboratory capacity for testing to identify Zika infection. Initially, early on in the response, CDC was really the only place that was doing the IgM testing and doing most of the PCR testing. Um, now many states are starting to uh, get these tests up and running in their labs, and that will make it so that people can get answers quicker um, rather than having uh, having to wait for the results of the CDC lab. Um, we're assisting with development of tests that can improve detection of previous infection with Zika. We're working with partners to improve mosquito control efforts, and we're providing recommendations for prevention and, um, and as well as for guidance for clinical care. And we're working, um, we worked actually very closely with ACOG on the pregnancy guidelines and with AAP for the uh, pediatric guidelines. And those will continue to be updated as we have additional information. Um, we're also promoting effective health communication strategies and we're working very closely right now with our colleagues in Puerto Rico to get uh, messages out about ways to prevent Zika virus infection. And we're uh, also focusing on supporting the state, local, tribal, and territorial response efforts. We had on April 1st a Zika uh, action plan summit where we were encouraging states that are um, likely to have Zika virus local transmission um, to work on their preparedness, and we were providing uh, technical assistance for them to do that. So I just want to end by thanking the many uh, collaborators and partners and then a, a very large staff at CDC that is working on this right now. And um, I guess we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you. So I'd like to now welcome um, Dr. Safadi. So Marco is Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Pediatrics at the Santa Casa de Sao Paulo School of Medical Sciences. He's a member of the Brazilian Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and he is living the um, Brazilian epidemic, and so he'll be speaking on the management of, the, uh, of Zika in an endemic areas. Um, welcome, Marco. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Pablo, David, and Roberta for the invitation. It's, it's really <coughs> a pleasure to be here and to share with you <coughs> the, ex the experience you had in Brazil uh, with the Zika outbreak. Uh, we are now facing this situation for almost one year. The first autochthonous transmission of Zika virus uh, was identified in Brazil in May 2015. And we have to acknowledge that in less than one year, we really learned a lot uh, with this uh, virus. And we learned new information that should revisit the written literature. Uh, so a lot of things uh, were now uh, being able to be uh, uh, unrevealed. And my intention in this 30 minutes is to share with you uh, here in the US uh, our experience in Brazil, really to tell the story uh, or, or what we learned uh, regarding the Zika uh, outbreak that we are facing, that we are still facing in, in, in Brazil. I have no interest to declare for this uh, presentation. There's a little bit uh, uh, repeated information, but I think it should be done to reinforce some of the uh, concepts regarding the Zika virus. As Sonia pointed out, this uh, is an arbovirus. We have two major lineages, and currently we have the Asian lineage circulating in Brazil. It's transmitted primarily by, by vector, not only Aedes aegypti, but also Albopictus and other species of uh, uh, Aedes. And we learned recently uh, in Brazil that vertical transmission is also uh, uh, possible, sexual transmitted, currently only limited to men to women or to men to men. So far, no sexual transmission was identified from women to men. So we have uh, almost at least 10 cases identified in the literature, uh, only men to women or men to men. We have one 
transfusion associated transmission reported in Brazil in the city of Campinas in Sao Paulo. Uh, Zika virus RNA has been identified in asymptomatic blood donors. And to be honest, this is very important because in an endemic setting like Brazil, where theoretically we have a significant proportion of those who are infected asymptomatic, they can be potentially donors. So after this identification, we definitely should start to doing screening in, in those uh, blood banks uh, uh, for uh, uh, blood donors. Uh, this is a paper that has been published a few weeks ago, two weeks ago. I brought this because I thought it was interesting. As Sonia mentioned, Zika virus was first identified in Uganda uh, 60, more than 60 years ago in monkeys uh, in, in, in surveillance for yellow fever. And this paper uh, published recently detected Zika virus among new tropical primates in Brazil, non-human primates, anticipating that they could act as reservoirs similar to the silvatic cycle of yellow fever in Brazil. I don't know if you can see here, but these uh, dark spots are uh, the places where these primates, and most of them were pets, uh, were uh, uh, identified, and, and the, the Zika virus was uh, uh, identified. And in green and in red are the places in this state, in the northeast region of the country, where we are seeing suspected and confirmed cases in humans. Clinical manifestations, as Sonia pointed out uh, before uh, circulating in Brazil, if we go to the written literature, it was written there, there's a self-limiting disease without complications, without hospitalizations, and without deaths. That's not true. We learned recently that, yes, we can have complications. Uh, we definitely can have hospitalization, and we are seeing some death related to the Zika uh, outcomes. However, the presentations of the disease are definitely mostly asymptomatic. Uh, when infection uh, is symptomatic, it can cause a broad range of clinical symptoms. For us who have chikungunya, and dengue also circulating in Brazil, it's really very difficult to distinguish between dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. I don't know if you are aware, but last year we had one and a half million reported cases of dengue in Brazil. Currently, we are facing a chikungunya outbreak in the Northeast, where last year we had Zika, now we are having chikungunya. It's like uh, uh, Sosefi waves uh, Zika uh, after chikungunya and then dengue and also co-infections. So it's really a challenge for those clinicians who are in the field to distinguish all these uh, uh, conditions. As Sonia pointed out, fever, uh, maybe this is a clue. The rush in the Zika is a very prurigenous rush. This is distinct from dengue and distinct from chikungunya. Uh, the patients uh, who have Zika, they report that the rush is really prurigenous. Arthralgia, conjunctival hyperemia, other symptoms like myalgia, headache, edema of extremities. This is also more uh, uh, concentrated in Zika patients, heteroorbital pain and vomiting. So uh, uh, here we can can highlight maybe the four major symptoms that can help physicians to identify Zika uh, in comparison to dengue and to chikungunya. Fever is not uh, uh, that high as we see in dengue. Edema of extremities is r rare in dengue and chikungunya and frequent in Zika. Uh, the rush, as I mentioned, is very prurigenous and conjunctivitis, uh, hyperemia conjunctivitis, non-purulent conjunctivitis is what we are frequently seeing in those patients uh, with Zika. Here I brought some images for you of patients uh, with Zika in, in Brazil. This is the rush in, 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 in two different patients. Here we can see, besides the rush, the edema uh, in this patient uh, uh, presented also in the hands and, 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 and in the feet. Also 
conjunctival hyperemia. This is the major manifestations for those who are symptomatic. We represent approximately 20% of the patients. So you can assume that 80% of the patients are asymptomatic. <clears throat> Lab diagnosis, just uh, one brief uh, message regarding the diagnosis. This is also a challenge. Uh, we are relying the diagnosis in RT-PCR, and you can imagine in a country like Brazil, we do not have PCR available in all hospitals, in all places, in all cities, in all uh, uh, rural areas. So it's really a challenge to perform uh, the diagnosis of those patients. Uh, uh, what we know is that the viremia uh, related to acquired Zika, I'm telling about the acquired cases, uh, uh, is during definitely the first three to five days. So if you wanted to do a, a PCR to diagnose uh, a Zika in those acquired infections, ideally you should perform the collection uh, of blood during the first three to five days is where we have the uh, uh, highest positivity of uh, RT-PCR after the onset of, of symptoms. Serology is a challenge because uh, there are some uh, Elijah and other uh, uh, serology available. However, uh, the serology that we have for Zika is uh, associated uh, with a high risk of cross-reactivity. And again, in endemic, setting like ours, we usually have dengue, chikungunya circulating, and we also have one peculiar thing. Brazil does, in uh, specific regions, yellow fever vaccination, which is also a flavivirus, and the vaccine is a life-attenuated vaccine. So theoretically, patients that receive it, the yellow fever vaccine can theoretically cross-react it cross-react uh, also with Zika. So the main issue, the main challenge with the serology is this potential cross-reactivity with the other uh, flavivirus and other arbovirus uh, infections. Uh, one interesting point, I don't know if you are aware, but uh, how Zika virus was introduced in Brazil. Uh, as I mentioned, in May was the first autochthonous detection, and Brazil was the first country in the Western world to identify Zika. And we raised a lot of assumptions on how the virus was introduced uh, in Brazil. In 2014, we have sad memories of the World Cup, uh, German sad memories. However, uh, we had no uh, uh, team from uh, Pacific Islands uh, uh, playing the World uh, Tournament in Brazil. But we have another World Cup in Brazil in 2014, which was the canoeing uh, World Cup with a lot of experts from the Pacific Islands, Samoa, French Polynesia, Papua, Guinea, etc. So they are the real experts in canoeing. And uh, a paper published in the Emerging Infectious Diseases last year found that the uh, virus identified in Brazil was exactly almost 100 percent identical uh, with the Asian lineage that was circulating in those countries at that time. Another possibility more recent was also published in Science uh, a few weeks ago, saying that phylogenetic and molecular analysis uh, showed that the single introduction of the Zika virus into the Americas was estimated to have occurred between May and December, but from 2013, based uh, uh, on the identification of these uh, clock analysis. So we don't know uh, uh, with certainty, but probably between 2013, the end of 2013 and uh, 2014, the virus was introduced in Brazil and found it a perfect place to circulate due to the weather in the Northeast region, Due to the presence of our close friend named Aedes aegypti, we are trying to get rid of this Aedes, but we uh, must say that we are really failing in the, uh, uh, the, the control of this uh, vector. Uh, what is the 
happy situation currently in Brazil. Uh, in 2016, until week 13 that we have uh, available reported in the net, Brazil reported almost 100,000 probable cases of Zika, of which 30 thousand counts cases were confirmed. The highest incidence uh, were in those states here in the, cent in, in the central west region, like Mato Grosso, uh, also in the northeast region of the country, and also Rio de Janeiro. I'm from Sao Paulo. We are not seeing, uh, or at least in the city of Sao Paulo, we are not seeing, but in some uh, uh, rural areas and uh, cities in the state of Sao Paulo, we are also observing uh, uh, cases of Zika. So the incidence rates in those states were between 150 and almost 500 cases per 100,000 uh, habitants. Currently, we have almost 8,000 pregnant women with suspected uh, Zika virus disease currently under follow-up, of which almost 3,000 cases were confirmed for Zika, and these pregnant women even are under, under follow-up. This is the evolution, as Sonia mentioned, with the number of countries uh, in the world. And as she mentioned, currently we have 42 to 43 uh, countries, including some territories from US uh, with uh, Zika uh, activity. And as I mentioned, uh, we have to divide the current knowledge of Zika and between and after the circulation in the Americas. Uh, before circulating in Brazil, this was the only piece of data I found in the literature showing that maybe there was a risk of Guillain-Barré syndrome after Zika. It was in French Polynesia. The first case of uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome developed after Zika infection. There was a lot of uh, limitations in, in this uh, uh, publication. The diagnosis of Zika was performed by serology. And they also observed that the incidence of uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome in French Polynesia uh, was multiplied by almost 20 uh, fold in, in, in the country since the beginning of the Zika uh, epidemic. It was the only piece of data uh, showing that maybe Guillain-Barré syndrome uh, was uh, related to Zika. Then they retrospectively uh, published some papers and they also published this case control study, a very elegant case control study, finally providing evidence that Zika virus infection caused uh, uh, or increased the risk of uh, uh, developing Guillain-Barré syndrome. The incidence of Guillain-Barré syndrome cases during the French Polynesian outbreak was finally estimated to be 0 0.2 per 1,000 Zika virus infections. So that's the theoretical risk that we can estimate of the burden of this neurological outcome taken in account in the denominator, uh, the number of Zika virus infections. And uh, curiously, there was a specific type of Guillain-Barré syndrome, the Amman type, which is characterized by distal motor nerve involvement, the absence of typical patterns, and a faster recovery. That's an observation in French Polynesia that patients uh, uh, with Guillain-Barré syndrome had a better prognosis when comparing to the usual prognosis uh, of Guillain-Barré syndrome. The duration of hospital stays stay with 11 days. The duration of those who uh, were admitted to uh, ICU intensive care obviously was, was higher, 51 days. The median age, 42 years, uh, almost no cases in children and adolescents. And exactly what we are observing in Brazil. So far, we have very preliminary data from those states in Bahia and Pernambuco in the northeast region of the country. This is the way we are confirming cases uh, of Guillain-Barré syndrome related to all arboviroses, to dengue, to chikungunya, uh, and to Zika. And so far, preliminary data uh, of some cases of Guillain-Barré, exactly the same median age, also uh, an interval uh, uh, between infection and neurological manifestations similar to what was observed in French Polynesia, and also duration of hospital stay usually uh, uh, similar and, and, and lower than we 
usually observe uh, with Guillain Barré. Uh, last week, uh, we had presented in the American uh, Academy of Neurology uh, a Congress uh, an abstract from uh, Brazil uh, identifying cases of acute myelitis and also of ADEM, of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. So uh, uh, two cases uh, uh, of myelitis and two, two cases of ADEM uh, was associated to uh, Zika virus infection. This is very recent uh, uh, data uh, presented last week and not yet published. And the microcephaly issue. Uh, October last year, uh, we had a meeting. I was present in this meeting in Sao Paulo, and we had colleagues from the Northeast region. And they asked me, Marco, are you seeing an increased number of microcephaly cases in your hospital? I said, I'm not seeing. I'm seeing what I usually see, toxoplasmosis, cytomegalovirus, uh, etc." And they said, we are observing definitely a huge uh, increase in the number of cases of newborns with microcephaly, uh, with uh, cerebral calcifications and other neurological outcomes. We don't know yet what it is, but we definitely know it's not dengue because we are very used to the dengue outcomes in pregnancy. We do know it's not chikungunya because we have performed some cohort studies in pregnant women and we know that chikungunya uh, does not provoke this kind of things. And curiously, the mothers of those uh, newborns with microcephaly, at least 70% of the mothers reported a febrile rush during pregnancy, mainly in the first and in the second trimester. And they started to uh, uh, search uh, for uh, uh, the etiology of those microcephaly cases. And Zika uh, was identified in the region in the beginning uh, of last year. So these children were being born in October, September, October, exactly uh, almost eight to nine months after the peak of the outbreak in the northeast region of Zika, suggesting that maybe Zika was the guilty uh, pathogen related to those microcephaly cases. At this month in November, we had the World Society Pediatric Infectious Disease Congress in Brazil, and we presented at this Congress the first uh, communication to the scientific community that maybe Zika was the cause of those cases of microcephaly. We were investigating, but we have a lot of uh, uh, evidence already pointing out that probably Zika was uh, uh, the player uh, of, that, of that cases. These are some of the picture of the newborns with microcephaly. Uh, what call it our attention is that the uh, uh, newborns were disproportional. They liked the damage was like concentrated to the brain, was much different when we compare to toxo, when we compare to CMV, where the newborns are uh, uh, affected more globally. The newborns that were uh, uh, born in, with microcephaly and other neurological mal malformations, they were concentrated in the brain. It's uh, theoretically, it's like the virus was only damaging the brain of those newborns. Really, microcephaly and neurological finds included not only microcephaly, but calcifications uh, in the thalamic and the uh, periventricular area. Uh, ventriculomegaly, lisencephaly, a genesis of corpo caloso, cere cerebellar alterations, and pachygyria. was really a congenital syndrome. Microcephaly was just a sign, just a symptom. Those kids uh, were like a congenital syndrome, a new congenital syndrome that we were observing uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, we went to the literature and we found this publication, and the year is uh, 1952, and interestingly, few years after the virus was identified in Uganda, this was an, an animal study in mice uh, 
Mice were challenged uh, with uh, Zika virus, and what happened with those mice is that the virus was highly neurotropic and recovered only in the brain and not in other tissues of those mice. Uh, these are some MMWR report of those cases of microcephaly, just to show, we, just to show you that uh, in those states in Pernambuco, in Paraíba, and in Bahia, northeast region of the country, here in this week, uh, 9 to uh, 12 to 13 week, we had the peak of the Zika outbreak. And here we are seeing the microcephaly cases. Coincidentally, approximately uh, 40 weeks after the peak of the outbreak. This is the current situation in Brazil. Uh, these uh, red dots are confirmed cases of microcephaly and or neonatal central nervous system alterations suggestive of congenital infections. These are cases that were already investigated uh, all other causes were discarded, and these are cases that are probably related to congenital infections. Some of them already confirmed for Zika. So the current picture, uh, it, by April, uh, this is last week report, we had approximately 7,000 suspected cases of microcephaly reported in Brazil since October last year. Among those 7,000 cases, Three, uh, half of them, 3,500 uh, 3, cases, were already investigated. And among those already investigated, approximately one-third of the cases were confirmed for neonatal alterations in the central nervous system, suggestive of congenital infections. And among those one-third cases already confirmed, Zika virus was lab confirmed in approximately 200 cases. It's not that the other 1,000 cases are not Zika, but we were not able to identify the Zika virus in, in those uh, newborns. And we have death. We have so far uh, 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 54 fetal or neonatal death confirmed uh, for microcephaly and CNS alterations should, suggestive of congenital infections. This is also an interesting piece of data that I would like to share with you. These are third neonates with microcephaly in Brazil. Samples of CSF and serum were tested for IgM specific for Zika. And 97% of those CSF samples and 90% of those serum samples were positive for IgM uh, in the CSF and in the blood. This is a very uh, known from all of you, uh, is a very emblematic uh, report. Is a Slovenian woman that were living in Brazil in the Northeast region. She went back to Slovenia and she diagnosed it. Uh, 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 she was pregnant and she diagnosed a fetal malformation and she decided to interrupt the uh, pregnancy. And the outcome, as you all know, uh, uh, was uh, uh, a newborn uh, with huge damage in the brain and only in the brain without other uh, tissues involved in, in this uh, uh, scan. This is a case from my hospital that I decided to bring to you because I found it very interesting. It's a male, two month old, born in January the 2nd this year at 40 weeks of gestation with three 1,000 grams, 3 kilograms, 48 centimeters, and head circumference of 32.5. And one comment here. At the beginning, we establish as a screening method for uh, diagnosing microcephaly, 33 centimeters, which is a very uh, sensitive threshold. And in February, we change it to a more restrictive, less sensitive threshold, which is now 31 0.9 centimeters for males and uh, a little bit less for uh, female newborns. But this child, when uh, he was born, 
the method was 30 centimeters, and that's why uh, this boy was screened for microcephaly. The mother reported a febrile prurigenous rush around the uh, uh, second trimester, 24 week of the gestation. Her, her husband presented a similar disease three weeks earlier after returning to Sao Paulo from a trip to northeast Brazil. So we probably think that the sexual transmission occurred here. We do not know because we had Aedes in Sao Paulo, so maybe Aedes uh, was the vector, but maybe it was a sexual transmission. But the interesting thing is that uh, this is the MRI, uh, this is the CT and this is the MRI, uh, 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 some root calcifications, ventriculomegaly, etc. But the interesting thing is that when this child arrived in our hospital with two month old, we did PCR. We did PCR in blood, in, in urine, in saliva, and the results were positive for a Zika uh, PCR in serous saliva, urine, and plasma at almost two month old and also with IgM and IgG positive uh, for, those, for this infant. So this case report, in my opinion, is very intriguing since it brings to discussion two key points. The first one, the true burden of the congenital disease associated uh, with Zika virus is probably underestimated, assuming that it is likely that a significant proportion of the affected newborns have subclinical manifestations, as we know with Toxo, as we know with CMV, without microcephaly, which is currently the threshold to start investigating those kids, preventing those infants to be diagnosed by the current ascertainment method, at least until later uh, in childhood and adolescence. And the second intriguing point is if persistent viremia is present in these congenitally infected infants, can we expect that further damage can be done in the brain of those infants? Can we assume that an infant in the first two or three months of age, immunologically uh, 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 limited, can have still further damage? This is uh, 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 assuming points. And finally, why the occurrence of microcephaly and other neurological congenital malformations related to maternal Zika virus infection during pregnancy was not detected before the outbreak in Brazil? As part of the community was very skeptical about this relationship when it started last year. But let's analyze it uh, with details. In French Polynesia and other islands in Pacific, the annual birth cohort is 4,000 newborns. Taking into account the baseline incidence of microcephaly and assuming that it can increase tenfold higher, we would have four to eight cases per year in French Polynesia. We have beautiful places also in Brazil, like here in Pernambuco. And this is the carnival, and this is a highly densely populated community. And our annual birth cohort is almost three million, uh, similar to what you have in the US. So they are densely populated, facilitating the identification of an increased number of newborns with neurological malformations. And last but not least, population in Brazil was 100% susceptible to Zika virus, was naive to this virus. If the Zika virus infection is associated with lifelong immunity, which I currently do not know, I assume, but I do not know, in places where the virus is circulating for years, it's reasonable to assume that a significant proportion of the women in the childbearing age will reach this age already infected in early uh, childhood or adolescence, and so theoretically protected against uh, viremia and uh, the outcomes in pregnancy. Uh, this is a uh, paper uh, mentioning the risk of microcephaly related to Zika in French Polynesia, around 1% of those infected in the first trimester, not only uh, uh, damage to the brain, but also to the macular region was observed in Brazil in some infants. Not only Brazil is seeing those cases, other countries that have uh, later circulation 
for obvious reasons, are seen later, these outcomes and Colombia, Venezuela, and other countries in Central America are also observing microcephaly and the other neurological outcomes. Vaccines, as Sonia mentioned, uh, uh, she mentioned the three uh, platforms, and just one uh, uh, thought here. Remember, this is a, an infection associated with the risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So a vaccine in phase one, phase two, and phase three trials should look for those outcomes, even if it's an inactivated vaccine, even being inactivated. There is a theoretical risk of increased Guillain-Barre syndrome, and this should be one of the outcomes uh, in any vaccine trial to be performed uh, uh, after this uh, point. So sorry for uh, being a bit late, Pablo, and this is my key points to finish my presentation. We have co-circulation of dengue, Zika, and chikungunya for the very first time in Brazil. Unfortunately, currently, the only intervention available to mitigate, to decrease the burden of Zika disease and other arboviroses in Brazil is mosquito control, which I am regret to say that uh, we are really failing in, in this control in my country. The true burden of the congenital disease associated to Zika is probably underestimated. The potential teratogenicity of the Zika was established in Brazil for the first time, and as Sonia pointed out, we still have a lot of unanswered questions like risk factors, uh, other uh, uh, neurological outcomes, risk factors for congenital disease, and we are currently performing some case control and some cohort studies uh, in pregnant women uh, to better uh, know the true burden of this disease. Thank you. Well, these have been great talks, and we're moving on to our last one um, by Dr. Karen Nielsen. She's a pediatric infectious disease physician at Mattel Children's Hospital and professor of clinical pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the David Geffen UCLA School of Medicine, where she also directs the Center for Brazilian Studies. She's originally from Rio de Janeiro, where she trained in pediatrics, then we stole her here for the last 25 years. She completed her pediatric ID training and master's in pu public health and has collaborated for many years with her colleagues in Brazil on perinatal and pediatric HIV. Um, Dr. Nielsen is the senior author of the recently published study in the New England Journal of Medicine that we've been talking about already um, about pregnant Zika infected women in Rio de Janeiro and that will be the focus in addition to some other things in her talk. Welcome, Dr. Nielsen. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank the organizers for inviting me. It's an honor to be with my distinguished colleagues. And I'll be focusing about Zika in pregnant women in Rio, as was mentioned. This actually is a clipping from a newspaper from Rio in November when I was actually there to attend the World Society for Pediatric Infectious Diseases the doctor meeting that Dr. Safadi mentioned. Microcephaly is already epidemic. And the press, I have to say, since September, October in Brazil had already been alluding to the fact that Zika was probably behind uh, the epidemic of microcephaly. Unfortunately, um, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I would like to have NIH funding <laughs> for the work we've been doing, but hopefully this is going to change and we're going to become conflicted as we get grants. But um, all the work that I'm going to present was not done with uh, any specific funding. So as Dr. Safari alluded to, uh, Zika first occurred, was reported in Brazil in uh, March 2015. It was the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation at the time that, that identified Zika virus in blood specimens specimens from these patients. It was an atypical dengue type presentation. And um, so this is how the story started in Brazil, as we heard. I also wanted to mention the disastrous World Cup of 2014 for Brazil, which of course uh, might have brought some tourists from the French Polynesia. But it was probably the canoeing event as another probably precursor of the introduction of um, Zika in Rio. And this, I thought this was interesting. This was actually um, uh, the advertising for the event where the Polynesians would be taking over the city of Rio and um, uh, hardly did we know that Zika would come along as well. However, where science uh, in, uh, will um, intersect 
with soccer. There, this paper that Dr. Safadi mentioned actually alluded to the fact that maybe Zika was introduced a year earlier through the uh, pre-qualifying championships for the World Cup. Uh, and at that point, Brazil was actually in the first place, didn't fail miserably then um, in the soccer championship. But it is thought by this paper that maybe the virus was introduced um, in the city of Rio and other cities because these qualifying events happen all over Brazil in June of 2013. And based on, on this finding, maybe the virus had been there for longer than we um, imagine. Uh, this is the canoeing event in Rio, or this is where it would have been. I just bring it up because that's where I grew up. But um, before we talk about Zika, I think we have to mention um, Aedes aegypti in Brazil. And um, Aedes aegypti is not a mosquito that's uh, endemic to the Americas. It was actually brought over uh, from Africa during the African, when the African population was, was brought over to the Americas. And it, the, the vector came at that time and has adapted extraordinarily well to the uh, uh, South American and Central American setting. Um, it was cleared in the 1930s and in, in Brazil, in Rio specifically, Osvaldo Cruz was actually, uh, drove a very successful effort to eradicate uh, the vector and eliminate yellow fever from Rio. And for many years, there was no Aedes aegypti. Of course, at that time, we did not have uh, resistance from the mosquitoes to the insecticides. We used DDT, and there was a much smaller population. But as of the mid-1980s, the vector came back with a full vengeance and repopulated all of the America, especially the coastal areas and central and southern areas of, of Brazil. And this is just to show, this is from the late 90s, early 2000s, that pretty much every municipality in Brazil reported uh, uh, being infested by Aedes aegypti with dengue being um, a problem nationwide. And Rio has suffered since the mid-1980s with dengue. There was a horrible epidemic uh, in uh, 1991. Then there was a terrible epidemic in 2002. This was a dengue three epidemic in Rio where uh, Probably one third of the workforce actually uh, had dengue at that time. It was a major d disaster. There was another epidemic in 2008 and another one in 2013. And all this time, um, new uh, virus strains, new dengue strains were introduced and have affected Rio. So uh, why does this happen? And this is true for Zika as well. You have stagnant water everywhere. You have overcrowding, overpopulation. And of course, you have a lot of uh, inequality and uh, low standards of living where people do not have have air conditioning, where they live in groups uh, in, in cluttered set settings, they live outside, they work outside, and it's almost inevitable not to be uh, bitten by a mosquito. So three viruses and a mosquito, it would be four viruses because it would include the yellow fever virus had we not have a vaccine. But the same vector transmits Zengi, De Zika, dengue, and chikungunya. And there is an epidemic, as Dr. Zafari mentioned, of all three happening at the same time in successive waves. And this, is ju this slide just shows pregnant women and the fear of Zika. And where you have uh, cases of Zika virus infection, there are cases of microcephaly reported. This is from the paper in Science as well. And even the this has made news all over the world, and this is a, fr from last week from the LA Times, and the major concern of women delivering in Brazil is what's the size of the baby's head when the baby is born, because there's a, this is an Im incredible impact in the already very strained health system that, uh, as you know, Brazil is also having a political economic crisis at the present time. This was also from the article of the LA Times, talking about the cases of microcephaly. Well, now I'm going to talk about our own study. Um, this is uh, Rio, this is Ipadema Leblon, and this is the father of Bossa Nova, Don Jobim, a beautiful city. This is the Fiocruz Institute, uh, which, which is, uh, I've been collaborating with the Fiocruz Institute for many years be, um, in my former life with uh, pediatric HIV. And this is my colleague and friend, Patricia Brazil, who's actually the lead person in the study and the data I'm going to present. We are contemporaries from medical school, although we went to different medical schools in Rio, but we graduated at the same time. We had been working on um, trying to write a dengue grant before all this happened. Um, the group at Fiocruz reported the first case of local transmission in Rio, which happened to be in an HIV-infected patient who actually did quite well, um, had mi a minor illness, but that was the first 
case in Rio. And as you can see, um, there were suspected cases of Zika virus in Rio as of January of 2015. The ones, the, what is in gray here are confirmed cases by uh, real-time PCR assays. And as we can see, from January to August, Zika was introduced in Rio and uh, cases were reported. This is also from our Fiocruz group. So uh, how did this happen? How did we uh, follow a prospective cohort of uh, women infected with Zika? Um, there was a big effort because of all the dengue that's been occurring in Rio for uh, so many decades to do dengue surveillance in the community. And uh, my colleagues in Brazil had been working on a pregnancy cohort, a mother-infant pair cohort, where pregnant women would be followed for dengue. Dengue rates are extraordinarily high. 95% of the women who live in the communities around the favelas around Fiocruz are, have um, serologic evidence of dengue. And we've been following these mother-infant pairs, and we were looking at what these outcomes are, what's the placental pathology, and so forth. So when Zika was introduced in, into Rio, um, uh, it was sort of simple to just modify the cohort study that was being at the same time uh, and include women with Zika. And the way this was done, uh, women would come in with a history of a rash, and they would be offered enrollment into the study. Uh, uh, PCR is performed in blood, in serum specimens, or in the urine. To be entered into uh, this cohort, you have to have had a rash within the last five days. Actually, you have to have a rash at the time of presentation. So this is not a cohort of asymptomatic patients, really symptomatic patients. And to date, actually, to this day, 110 infants uh, have been born to this cohort. It's, the, it's our Zika cohort, or women with suspected Zika virus infection. And 400 women have been enrolled, pregnant women with suspected Zika in the study. So this is the paper we published with our preliminary results when we did the first data analysis of women enrolled in this cohort. And the way that this study was done, as I said, women would come in because they have a rash and they want to be diagnosed whether they have Zika or not. Uh, blood serum was tested for Zika PCR and urine as well. Um, as was alluded to, you're usually viremic for a very short period of time, three to five days, and urine can be positive for about 14 days, but in, in all our cases, these women had been symptomatic for only the last five days. So uh, we identified 72 women who had Zika virus positive PCR in the serum, in the urine, or in both specimens. 16 of the women at that time uh, were negative. And uh, of these 72 women, 42 agreed to have ultrasounds performed. Two had first trimester ab uh, abortions. One was mis uh, miscarriage. The other one was induced. And 28 women declined um, to have ultrasounds performed. And they said, we'll see when the baby's born. Um, at the time that we uh, wrote this paper, eight deliveries had happened, and 78 pregnancies had been ongoing. And these are the, this has been presented already, but it's just to show the macular or macular papular rash, blanching rash. Uh, this is the papular, and you can have like a lacy reticular rash also. Uh, actually, parvovirus B19 is one of the differential diagnoses when we look at all these rashes during pregnancy, besides dengue and chikungunya, and as well as syphilis or rubella or acute HIV. Most women in Brazil are immunized against rubella, so we're not as worried that that would be uh, in the differential. This is painful swelling, uh, retroauricular lymph node, and as was alluded to before, erythemal injection, palpable erythema, conjunctivitis are prominent findings. I just want to mention that to call it Zika fever is really a misnomer, and the reason for that is because in, in our own uh, set of data, only 28% of the women who were Zika virus positive by PCR, these are symptomatic women, actually had a fever. Fever was low. It was never higher than 38, and in 60% of the women, who actually had any fever, this fever uh, lasted for a day or less. So fever was uh, an interesting feature that is not um, present and is distinguishing from dengue, which usually gives you high-grade fever when it's symptomatic. But of course, everyone had a rash because that was the entry criteria, but macular, macular, papular rash were present, and this sort of differentiated between women, women who were Zika virus negative. The rash was certainly periginous, as Dr. Safadi mentioned. Uh, interestingly, rubella also causes a periginous rash, so it, it could actually mimic rubella. We had conjunctival injection. 40% of the women had uh, lymphadenopathy, and as I alluded to, the fever. Um, just one thing, uh, respiratory symptoms are, are not present really in, in Zika virus infection. Probably the women who had it here had a, another uh, infection at the same time, so if, if women have a sore throat or respiratory symptoms, maybe it is unlikely as a clinical feature of Zika just for the differential. 
I just want to, this was alluded to before, the cross-reactivity between uh, Zika virus, the flaviviruses, and other flaviviruses. This is just to show that all the women, um, the women when we got their serum, when they presented with the clinical, in, um, clinical symptoms, 88% actually had uh, positive antibodies to dengue. And the other thing that we didn't report in our findings, but also happened, a very high number of women converted, developed dengue IgM as they had uh, acute Zika virus infection. They were PCR positive for Zika. They were PCR negative for dengue, but their IgM for dengue was becoming positive because of the cross reactivity. So this is a real diagnostic conundrum because PCR is limited in terms of the time frame in which it will be able to diagnose and how the IgM will perform and so forth it remains to be determined because we really need to be able to uh, diagnose this retrospectively. But our cohort was diagnosed prospectively. Um, just to mention our key findings, we had 20% of the women who had Zika had a partner who was ill at the same time. 40% had actually used repellents, but uh, they even so contracted Zika. Uh, the majority had uh, more than the half had more uh, family members who were also ill. Interestingly, there are very few children in the cohort with Zika, that, uh, at least with symptomatic Zika that we have found. Maybe they have asymptomatic infection, but um, we were screening for it and going out looking for it, and we did not find many children with Zika virus infection. The other uh, interesting point is in terms of pregnancy, more than half of the women were in the second trimester of pregnancy when they acquired the infection. And in terms of socioeconomic status, although Zika is more predominant in, in people of uh, lower resources, lower income, it, in our study we also saw uh, it affect other patients of higher socioeconomic status as well. And this is for those who like Rio, this is a map of the state of Rio. And this is just showing most of the cases happen in the city of Rio, but even areas where there's a higher altitude, like the uh, which is in the mountains, we did see Zika cases and women come. So this is probably the most important slide, and this is a, comes from an Excel figure that um, I worked on personally. And I must have done this figure about 50 times before we submitted, because I could not believe when we spread out, the black bars are the symptomatic babies, and these are all the cases by weeks of gestational age. And this is for the 42 women who had ultrasounds. And it starts at six weeks and goes all the way to 35 weeks. This is a time that they had a PCR positive for Zika virus. And what's in black are the women who had abnormal ultrasounds. And when I first did this, I thought that this was cluster all in the first trimester because that's where you would expect the abnormalities to happen. That's when the brain is being developed. And I, I did it over and over again because I thought there, there's something wrong. We've done this wrong. Someone else did it. And, and we took turns. And, and this is really the data. We actually we had problems at all trimesters of pregnancy in women with Zika virus infection. And this is what we found when we first looked at our data. We had one baby with microcephaly, but then we had a, a series of babies that had at the other central nervous system findings that have been described here. Uh, we did have a few infants who were small for gestational age. And what is interesting, in utero, these babies were thought to have uh, microcephaly as well. But when they were born, we found that their heads were proportionate to their bodies. They were just very small babies, as you see with rubella, or you can see with CMV as well. And really, microcephaly is a postnatal diagnosis. Um, all the obstetricians I talked to emphasize the fact that it's not really easy to diagnose this um, during uh, by ultrasound during pregnancy that's really a postnatal diagnosis. But what is important, I think uh, most important that we, we found, and we thought we were very surprised by, by this, is that we had two cases of uh, stillbirths in our cohort, one was a woman infected at 25 weeks who had a normal ultrasound at 30 weeks, and then at 36 weeks, the fetus was dead when she went in for a normal repeat ultrasound. And then we had another woman also infected at 32 weeks who had no prior ultrasound, but at 38 weeks, the fetus was also dead. This, these are stillbirths. Uh, these babies had autopsies done, and Zika was actually not found in these babies. So we were postulating that maybe v Zika was caused a vasculitis and affecting the placenta and to some extent causing the demise of these babies. We had also a near-death experience for a term baby who had an ultrasound at 40 weeks. The membranes had not ruptured, but there was no amniotic fluid present, and this baby had an emergency.
emergency C-section. And in, in the first, uh, uh, first week, this baby did not do well, but I, we believe it's from the hypoxia and the fetal distress, and now is, is thriving and, and has a normal exam. So these are just the cerebral calcifications, which we reported, periventricular calcifications. There's a host of central nervous system problems, as, as has been alluded to here before. Uh, this is our biometry. Um, baby number 19 was the only baby in our cohort that we reported out of the 72 that um, had microcephaly. These two babies actually were very small for gestational age, but when you plot them out, um, they seem to have microcephaly as well. So we did the bipyridal exam and this is the head circumference, um, plotting the same thing. And as you can see, these babies are falling off their curve from estimated fetal weight. And this continues to happen. We are seeing this in the babies that are being born from the cohorts uh, that we are following. So the patterns of pathology that we observed were these fetal abnormalities of the central nervous system, which happen between 8 to 27 weeks of gestation. So we have to remember that the brain is formed in the first trimester. So wh why is it that we see so much damage in Later, it's probably because the virus is destroying what is formed, and, and we're having we're seeing an involution of, of the process. We also saw impairment of fetal growth, which um, it reminds us of rubella and cytomegalovirus. We ha are seeing babies that are small for gestational age, and uh, severe uh, uh, fetal growth restriction. And we saw this pattern of placental insufficiency, oligohydramnias, and hydramnias, which is leading to fetal demise. We're continuing to follow, and we will be reporting um, the results as, as more babies are being born. And of course, there was a mixed pattern with IUGR and central nervous system abnormalities. But we did see um, no problems in 30 of 42 subjects. It's a small number, but it's reassuring that not everyone had an abnormal baby. This is our, our baby with microcephaly who was born. And this is the unfortunate case of the fetus, uh, the stillbirth fetus um, at uh, 38 weeks gestation. As you can see, multiple um, cord around his neck. Someone even postulated that the baby might have had seizures uh, in utero before demise. Anyway, our conclusion was that we all know that uh, Zika is associated with severe grave fetal outcomes, including death, placental insufficiency, growth restriction, of course, the CNS injury we have been talking about. Uh, yes, there are macular lesions. Uh, Dr. Safadi used the same slide. We're actually uh, using RedCam um, uh, photos of the retina to scan all these be babies. We're doing transfontanal exams. If there's any abnormality, they get a CT. The CTs are better to detect calcifications, but they can get an MRI as well. And we're looking at the retina and hearing. Uh, there's some re preliminary reports that Zika might be associated with hearing loss as well. Does this progress over time? We do not know. So uh, for the future, as has been mentioned before, is there lifelong immunity? We believe that there is immunity because actually Zika has virtually disappeared from Rio right now. We have enrolled 400 women in our first uh, in the first months of our enrollment. 75 to 80 percent of the women had Zika virus infection. This has dropped to about 65 of the 400 women we have. 65 to 50 percent have Zika. So Zika is really disappearing. We're seeing a burst of chikungunya. Maybe the mosquito cannot harbor both viruses at the same time. We actually actually have patients who are co-infected with Zika and chikungunya in our cohort. So uh, would passive antibodies prevent infection? If they're neutralizing, maybe they would be helpful. Um, in some situations in Brazil and Rio, when women know that they have Zika, they actually interrupt their pregnancies. They have a, a baby who's uh, born ahead of time. So we've been seeing a lot of premature babies trying to prevent this transmission. Uh, vector control, of course, is most important, antiviral de development. And of course, we need improved diagnostics because we really cannot re uh, diagnose this retrospectively, and it's a big problem. So just to finalize, this says that a mosquito, a mosquito is not stronger than a whole country. And so we'll zap the mosquito. And I just want to, this is the uh, Fiocruz team and um, Patricia Brazil, who's been leading the efforts in, in Rio. This is Luana, the study coordinator. And this is um, uh, Paulo, uh, Jose Paulo Pereira Jr., who's the obstetrician who performed all the ultrasounds. This is a Zika hat that he bought during Carnival, actually his son gave to him. And I want to thank my colleagues at UCLA as well, Dr. Cherry, who's here in the audience, who helped us um, look at this and saw the uh, similarities between uh, rubella congenital um, infection as well, and my colleagues in obst obstetrics. Thank you very much. Thank you.